morning, church. Good to be here with you this morning. Uh, Jessica and I are always pleased when we're able to be, be here in our church with our church family. Uh, last weekend, we, uh, we weren't traveling for business like we so often are. Last weekend, I had an unusual privilege of going and meeting my new grandson. His name is uh, Jonah Trammell, and uh, I think he's a pretty good little kid. Uh, so a week ago right now, while you were here and Ray was, uh, was coming up into the pulpit to preach to you and open the Word of God, I was there holding this little tiny eight-pound bundle of, of pennel. So he's a, he's a good kid. I wish that I could have brought him to display him to you this morning because he's one of the ten finest grandkids ever born. Obviously, he's my tenth. It's great to be here with you this, this afternoon or this morning and to, to open the Word of God together. Uh, after the service this afternoon, I'm going to be uh, with Jessica heading in the, jumping in the car, heading up to Jacksonville, where we will be uh, getting there just in time for the end of a great theater production. Uh, it's a Broadway show based on C.S. Lewis' book, The Screwtape Letters. It's playing at the Florida Theater in downtown Jacksonville, and uh, there'll be about a thousand people there. I'll get there in time for the end of the show to go up on stage and talk about the show and answer questions about C.S. Lewis and screw tape letters and theater productions and all of that and uh, stuff that I don't know that much about, but I'll fake it and it'll go fine. <clears throat> much more comfortable doing this this morning. Let's, uh, let's look to the Word of God together. We have an important uh, topic this morning that's part of our ongoing series created to worship. I, I love the concept of this when Greg first told me about it a couple of months ago and the different pieces of it because worshiping God is more than just uh, going to a worship service on Sunday morning. That sometimes people feel like they've worshipped if they went to what traditionally is called a worship service. Or sometimes there's a special night of worship or a worship time where it's a lot of music and everyone is worshipping. And just going to that is not particularly worshipping. Just standing and singing along with Brenton and the group that was up here is not especially worshipping. Those are all ways that we can worship in times that are set up for us to worship God together, but it still requires that we do something personally. Worshiping God is actually a frame of mind, a position of our heart that we have to intentionally acknowledge and put ourselves in, seeing the greatness of God, being aware of his glory and his goodness, his holiness, being aware of the fact that he's different than us, his majesty and his beauty, and all these things that are described to us in the scripture, including the fact that he, in his sovereign Love for us desired to have a way that we could actually, as imperfect beings, sinners, have relationship with him as his perfect being. And when we recognize all of that, the only natural proper response is for us to worship, to acknowledge his greatness, his goodness, his holiness, his differentness. The fact that he made it possible for us to even be in his presence, that is worship. And we do that not just through singing, we do that through listening to the teaching of the world or word or having times of personal devotion. We do that through acts of service. And this series that we're going through identifies many of those ways, but they all require that we actually do something. You don't worship without making a decision and doing something that is an act of worship. And this morning we're talking about worshiping God through the Great Commission. Let's, uh, let's ask God's blessing on our time and to guide us as we get into this. Please pray with me. Father, we're grateful this morning that we can be in this place to hear the teaching of your word. And I pray that your word, more than anything this morning, would become clear and plain to us. That we would have a fresh glimpse, a fresh understanding of your heart for the nations, for the great commission, the great commandment, this commissioning that you gave to us, your people, with purpose, with expectation that we would follow in obedience and actually do some things. So teach us and God has inspire us, Father, this morning to obey you as we worship you through the work of the Great Commission. And we pray these things, God, not for our benefit or not as a favor that we would ask to you, but God, that you, believing that this is what you want for us. And so we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The Great Commission is... Uh, something that we see in different parts of the scripture. Uh, in fact, one of those portions was read to us just a few moments ago by Ken. 
And uh, in different parts of the scripture, we see different versions of the Great Commission. And basically what those different versions are, are different people, the different disciples who were there when this happened, telling the story from their perspective and their words and their way. And they're all slightly different, but they all include these same basic elements that we see uh, in the primary one, or the one that's probably most recognized when people speak about the Great Commission. They're usually talking about the book of Matthew and the very end of the book of Matthew in chapter 28, where three basic things are identified. One is to go into all the world and to make disciples. So go into all the world and make disciples. Now this is Jesus talking to these guys who were his disciples. What did that mean? It means over the previous four years of Jesus' ministry, they had been following him around, listening to him teach, obeying the things he taught them, observing him as he did miracles, healing the sick, raising the dead, feeding thousands of people with small bits of food, speaking to a storm out on the Sea of Galilee, rebuking the storm and stopping it with his words, peace, be still. He, they saw all of these things and many, many more things happen, and they became his disciples, his followers. They listened to what he taught and worked to put that into practice in their lives. So in the Great Commission, we're being told to go into all the world and to make disciples, to do that same thing, to teach people those things, enough that they could actually make a decision to follow Jesus Christ. We, when we talk about this, we're talking about, in its essence, the gospel, the message of salvation. What are those things that have to happen, that transaction between God and man, or God and a person, that brings us into right relationship with him, the gospel of Jesus Christ? And we'll talk more about that this morning. So, go into all the world and make disciples. The second thing, teaching them to obey the things that I commanded you. These are really two separate elements. To go and teach the gospel, you could meet somebody and explain to them in simple terms how they can become a child of God, and we'll talk more about that this morning, and they can actually say a prayer of repentance and ask for salvation and enter into new life and new relationship with God and have that happen fairly quickly and in a very simple way because the message of salvation is very simple. But that's not the end, that's the beginning. That's the beginning of the journey. So go into all the world and make disciples. A second point, teaching them to obey the things that I've commanded you. That's why we're here this morning. That's why we study the Bible alone and together in groups and go to church to be taught by somebody who has spent time studying the Word of God so that we can learn more. Learn more about what has God commanded us. Our lives tend to be full of opinions and ideas about what we think is right and wrong. And this is something that's infected our society and our world that people's opinions about what's right or wrong or their thoughts and feelings about what is right or wrong tend to become pre, pre important, most important in their lives. But they're not. What I think about it is not really that important. It's what God says about it that's important. And that requires learning. Because sometimes what God says in his word is counterintuitive. It's not exactly what we would guess God would say. And so we have to go to God's word and understand it and have people who will teach us. And we should be, in doing the work of the Great Commission, teaching others those things that God has commanded and how to obey those things. Go to all the world, preach the gospel, teaching them to obey the things that I've commanded you. And then there's this third element that is uh, maybe the most important because without it, the other two wouldn't even be successful at all. That's when Christ said, and I'll be with you always. As you do this, I will be with you always. Not from time to time or not in certain circumstances where you say the right prayer or act just the right way. As you do this, I'm going to be with you personally always to the very end of the age. And so from that term to the very end of the age, that's one of the ways that we see that Christ, when he was talking to his disciples on the Mount of Olives, giving this great commission, he was not just talking to them, but through them talking to us. With, the prom with this command, go into all the world, make disciples, teach them to obey the things I've commanded you. And as you do this, Vero Bible Fellowship, I'm, I'm with you. I'm empowering you, enabling you, always, even to the very end. And that's, that, in its essence, is the Great Commission. A couple of important observations about the Great Commission. One was this was Jesus' final words to his disciples given face to face. So he had been with these men for four years, going around, doing all of these miracles and activities and teaching that we read about in the four Gospels in the New Testament. But this was the, they didn't know it was the end when they followed Jesus up onto the Mount of Olives that day, 
for all they knew, they were just going on another walk with Jesus like they'd done many, many times. And it was just practice to take them aside, sit down, explain things to them. And so he said, let's go up onto the Mount of Olives. And they followed him and they had no real expectation except to spend time with Jesus. But he knew that they would walk back down and he would not. This would be his final message to him, to them. So if you have the opportunity to make your final words to some people who you care about, you're probably going to give some thought to what those final words are. And so you can be certain that Jesus didn't just casually blurt out some things that day before he ascended into heaven, but instead he knew exactly what these, these guys needed to hear and what we needed to hear through Scripture before he ascended into heaven. So I believe that these words have particular importance. The second observation about this is that the Great Commission is not just some romantic concept. It's not just some philosophy, some nice idea. This was actually a commission, a commissioning, a commandment. Sometimes it's referred to not as the Great Commission, but the Great Commandment. When Jesus said this to these disciples, it was with the expectation that they would actually do what he said. We all uh, have authority in our lives. Most of us, it's in the workplace as well as maybe, you know, having a wife who's an authority over you also that tells you what to do. But in the workplace, if you have a boss and that boss gives you some instruction, an assignment with a timeline, then you're expected to do that, right? And if you don't, there are usually some kind of consequences. That's not just a suggestion. Or if you are a boss or a leader over some employees and you give them some assignments, with the, it's with the expectation they will actually do that and not decide later whether it's a good idea or say, man, that was a great concept, you know, great philosophy, but I'm not going to really take my time to do that. That doesn't work that way. There's an expectation with the commissioning, with a command, that there will be action carrying that out, getting something done. And so when we talk about the Great Commission, we need to understand this is Christ's final commandment to his disciples and through the word of Scripture to you and me. This is what he said we are to be doing until he returns with the promise that he'll be with us as we do it. Does that all make sense? Yes. So that's just kind of the, the background of what this is all about. I, I hope that you can agree with me this morning that in terms of all of that, that this matters. So this matters to us. And when we talk about the Great Commission, when we come together as a church, when we plan our ministries and our ministry fair that's going to be next week, when we do things like that, it needs to be with the idea that God has an expectation upon us of something that we should be doing and accomplishing here on earth as a church, not just to come together and sing and be happy and, and greet each other and be a family and encourage one another, pray for one another. All of that, yes. All of those are great things that... I'm glad to say kind of define this body of Vero Bible Fellowship in a special way, in my opinion. But that's not enough. We are to be doing the work of the Great Commission. So let's talk a little bit about how that would actually happen. What is it that we're supposed to do? Let's first look at the disciples and what their response was. Because they went up on that Mount of Olives that day with Jesus. He gave them this message. Then he ascended into heaven telling them that someday I'm going to come back in the same way that I went up. I'm going to come back. In the meantime, this is your work. And so when they went back down the mountain, what did they do? It's actually partly contained in the piece of scripture that uh, Ken just read for us a few moments ago at the end of that passage in Luke in chapter 52. Uh, let, let me just uh, turn to that and, and read that for you. Luke chapter 52, uh, 24, sorry, in verse 51 while he was blessing them, he left them and was taken up into heaven. Okay, so that's what happened. And then they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they stayed continually at the temple praising God. So what did they do in response to the Great Commission? First of all, I think it's important to know that they weren't torn apart with sadness or grief that now Jesus was gone. Instead, they went back down with great joy. God gave them some sort of an understanding of what was going on here and the expectation to them. And then they went to the temple, they rejoiced, and then they stayed at the temple and, and apparently started to, to work, to teach, to do the work of the gospel at the temple. More specifically, I want to turn our attention to another passage. This is in the book of Acts, and if you have your Bible, go ahead and turn to the book of Acts and uh, chapter 3. 
Acts chapter 3, there's a story here that I want to just touch on briefly as an example of dozens and dozens and dozens of stories in the New Testament that tell us what the disciples did after the Great Commission. The book of Acts is full of this. The book of Acts is short, that term Acts, short for Acts of the Apostles. The things that they did after Jesus ascended into heaven and they were carrying out the Great Commission. So to see what they did as an example for what we should do, let's take a look at this. Acts chapter 3, starting at verse 1. I'm just going to read this little story. If you don't have your Bible, that's fine. It's just a story. Just listen and get the story. One day Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer at 3 in the afternoon. Now, a man crippled from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful. That's the gate, not the guy. He may or may not have been beautiful, but the gate was called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. You get the picture? His friends carry him to this particular gate so that religious people going in and out of the temple court would see him there with the idea that these are people who should be inclined to maybe give him a little something and help this poor crippled guy. Okay, so when he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him, as did John, and Peter said, look at us. That's interesting, isn't it? You ever done that? A beggar comes up to you, you stand there for a minute and say, hey, look at me. That would get their attention, and it did, it got his attention. Look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. I'm sure the guy was thinking, this, this is going well. You know, most people walk by, don't even pay attention to me. These guys not only paid attention to me, but they're demanding my attention. They want something to happen here. I think this is going to be good. And then Peter said, and I'm sure this is a disappointment to the man, silver or gold I do not have, but what I have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Think about that guy now for a second. He's just sitting there. He does not yet know anything except he's not going to be getting any silver or gold from these two rascals. And then he says, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, get up and walk. And that had to puzzle him. I bet he was just sitting there for a minute, not sure what to do. And then as his mind processed that, at some point, he evidently decided, I'm not sure what's going on here, but I'm going to give it a try. Taking him by the right hand, they helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God, a.k.a. worshiping, because he experienced something, acknowledged the greatness of God, and was responding to that. When all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. This is part of what Peter and John and the rest of the disciples started doing after the Great Commission. They went around ministering to people. But they didn't just heal the guy. That would have been nice, that's a great blessing to heal this cripple who was begging at the gates of the temple in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, changed his life, caused him to worship God. But there was more than that because in the work of the Great Commission, there's more than just being a blessing to people or uh, doing nice things for them in the name of Jesus. That's all good, but that's not enough. That is not the Great Commission. Look down at verse 19. There's some other things that happen here in between, but they go turn their attention back to this formerly crippled man, and this is what they said, repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. This is the work of the gospel, to teach people not just that God is good and God is nice and God is powerful and able to heal a crippled person, but our response to a holy God is to repent so that our sins can be blotted out so that times of refreshing can come. And that is the work of the Great Commission. And that's what these guys, these disciples started doing, going around place to place in their ministry, doing all kinds of things, but at the heart of it all was actually teaching the gospel, the message of salvation, repentance of sin, and new life in Jesus Christ that comes through the forgiveness of sin. That's the gospel, that's the Great Commission. Okay, so that's what we saw happening in the New Testament times in response. That's what these guys did after they went down from the mountain, after Jesus gave them this great commissioning, this commandment, they went and started doing it. What about in our day? 
I have a couple of examples of people I'd like to share with you. These are people that I know who are doing something unusual, maybe a little bit extreme in the work of the Great Commission today as they go about their lives. In this first category that we're talking about, like in, in, in our own world, in our neighborhood, in our community, as we are face to face with people like Peter and John were. First, I want to tell you about Terry Lilly. We've got a picture to put up here. Uh, this, you might recognize the person who's with us, my wife, Jessica, and uh, this is her father. So this is my father-in-law, Terry Lilly. Terry uh, actually came to faith in Christ when he was serving in the Air Force in Taiwan through a mission group that was operating, doing Bible studies for servicemen near the Air Force base in Taiwan. And so he came to faith in Christ, went back, went to Bible college, got married, went back to Taiwan as a missionary. And, uh, and he spent years there. Jessica was born in Taiwan, lived there until she was 13, and then moved back to the U.S. where Terry, who's up here behind me, look at, looking at, look behind my back. I trust my father-in-law. Uh, he's up there, and he, 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 he started, a ch uh, not started a church, but became a pastor and uh, spent the next number of years pastoring. But here's what I wanted to tell you about Terry Lilly. Kind of, I, as I've gotten to know this guy, I've seen is very unusual. Uh, he uses his experiences, his experience in the Air Force. He, he, he often wears an Air Force hat. And I've seen as he goes around town, has coffee somewhere, walks down the street, has conversations with people, his Air Force hat is often a conversation starter. But it's not just, hey, look at me, I'm a veteran, you should be nice to me. He uses that as a conversation starter so that he can have a conversation with people, which he quickly turns to some kind of spiritual thing so he can talk to them about their relationship with God and the gospel. He also uh, has made it his point to, to spend time in the international communities. He lived in the Philippines, he lived in Taiwan, he lived uh, more recently for years in Minneapolis, Minnesota, where there's a huge Somalian community of refugees there, and he has made it his business to use that international experience again as conversation starters, a way to open conversations and talk to people about God. This is his method of just doing the work of the Great Commission in his everyday life. I think it's awesome. I don't really do it that way. He does. Here's another guy. This guy's name is Philip uh, Howard Moser. When my parents were, uh, when I, I was a child, my parents were missionaries in Ecuador. Howard and Ruth Moser were missionaries with them in Ecuador. And so I first met him when I was uh, first going into second grade. Uh, I still stay in touch with him, and here's why. Because his son, Phil, who was my best friend when we were kids, ended up uh, marrying my sister. And so now we're all family. So... <laughs> Uh, I was with Phil last week, my brother-in-law, and he was telling Jessica and I stories about his dad, Howard, who's been a missionary all of his life in South America, more recently in Spain, and, uh, and he was talking about, in fact, Phil was kind of embarrassed that he's talking about his dad, about this crazy stuff his dad does, like he was traveling with his dad on the airplane, everybody stands up when the plane gets to the gate, and that's when a lot of people start talking, and he starts talking to this guy, and Phil's standing there listening to his dad talk to this stranger. And, and the guy uses the Lord's name in vain. And so Phil's dad addresses that and says, hey, who, who is God to you? And he starts this theological conversation. And Phil was like, I kind of wanted to just crawl back down on my seat and disappear. Because that's not the way most of us conduct ourselves. But I think that's awesome. Like He just finds ways in conversation to turn people's attention in some casual way to talk about God, the reality of God and sin and Jesus Christ. Okay, there's something about these two guys. They're They're odd. You know, that's peculiar. The Bible says we should be a peculiar people. These two guys have that down pat. They, they act differently than most of us. I, I don't think all of us have to feel the, the burden or the pressure to do exactly what they do. If that's what God wanted us all to do, then God would have made us all with that personality and that skill set. But God does want us all to be part of the work of the Great Commission. That's just an example of two guys. We'll come back to some others, but I want to also talk about some, uh, some ways that Oh, sorry, I got, I got lost there. Okay, so God doesn't require us all to turn around, to walk around preaching like that, but God does require us, and don't miss this. I was listening to a, a, a great teacher, his name is Joe Stoll. Uh, some of you have read his books or heard him speak. I was with him a couple, couple of weeks, or it was back in September, uh, and he was speaking, and he stopped in the middle of his message, and he said this. When we're listening to a message, a lecture, watching a TV show or a movie, whatever we're doing, there are times when our attention kind of goes away, you know, it fades off and we think about something else. Don't let this be one of those times. This is important, so, so catch this. That was a cool trick, huh? I learned that from Joe Stoll. God doesn't require us all to walk around preaching like 
Phil Moser's dad or Jessica's dad, but he does require us, expect us, all to be active in the work of the Great Commission in some way that he has gifted and equipped us to do. One of those ways is that we should all, without exception, every one of us, have the ability when the need or occasion arises to be able to do what the Bible says, uh, give an answer to the hope that's within you, to be instant in season, out of season. What that means is to be ready at the drop of a hat if the occasion arises or you're talking to somebody and there's an opening or even a request to be able to explain the gospel in its simplest form so that they can understand what it means to be right with God and how that process takes place. And there may be some of you this morning who would say, man, I, I believe that's true, Marshall. I think we should all be ready to do that. I don't really know. I don't feel comfortable. And so what we're going to do is we're going to offer a, a simple class uh, that will teach anyone who wants to attend just a simple conversational method of presenting the gospel, not especially to go and do what these guys do, although it would work for that also, but just if you're having a conversation with somebody and, and it comes up and you have the opportunity or a request if somebody wants to know more about the hope that's within you, you're able to give an answer that will actually give them the ability to understand and come to faith in Christ. We're going to have a class. There's a sign-up sheet in the back. No dates. It hasn't been planned yet. If you're interested in taking that, you can put your name and email on that sign-up sheet, and then we'll let you know when it's going to happen. But there's another way, as this family, this group of people that meets in the cafeteria of Storm Grove Middle School week after week, there's another way that we can be active locally in the work of the Great Commission, that is to do what we can do to carry out the work of the church. Next week, we're going to have that ministry fair that, uh, that was mentioned earlier during the announcement time. Or it's just, ta it's not a fair. I don't think there will be clowns or Ferris wheels. <laughs> Probably not cotton candy, although there should be. Uh, I think it's just going to be tables set up with information about all the different ministries of our church. And the point is this. It's not just knowledge. What we want you to do is become aware of them so you can get plugged in. So that you can become part of some of those. Maybe you're not going to stand on the airplane and tell the gospel to some stranger in the aisle, but you could be the person who helps set up chairs or helps do some other arrangements or do the things that God has gifted you to do that is part of the work of this body, the work of the Great Commission, representing the gospel here in Vero Beach in Indian River County. I believe that that is what God expects of each one of us, to be active, to be participating in that. Not just to come in here and sit and listen and sing, but to be part of the work of the church, to have an active role in the work of the Great Commission, doing what God has enabled you, given you an interest in doing. Okay. Uh, that's the first part of this, what we need to be doing locally. But there's another part that I think is important is it is for us to be active in the work of the Great Commission locally, personally, fulfilling the Great Commission requires that we be diligent and strategic about our role in reaching the unreached world. Think about that term, the unreached world. You hear about that every now and then. We, we, we need to be active here, but there are parts of the world that don't have what we have. There's not the opportunity for somebody to see a sign out on the street that says Bureau Bible Fellowship is meeting down here and to wander into this room and be with us. There is not that. There aren't those churches, there aren't Christian people. And so we need strategically in our carrying out the work as an act of worship, the work of the Great Commission, we need to be thinking about how can we reach the unreached world. That's what, what are we talking about when we talk about the unreached world? First of all, studies show that there are about 2 billion people, the B, 2 billion people on earth who would be classified as unreached with the gospel. Okay, so just to give you context, there are approximately 7.7 .7 billion people on earth. That's a lot of us. 7.7 .7 billion people, 2 billion people of those 7.7. .7. So getting close to 30% of the population of the world is unreached with the gospel. Here's, here's what that means. When we say unreached with the gospel, there's got to be some way to define that term or else we wouldn't be able to use it. So here's what that means. People who have no contact with a Christian in their everyday life. They're not going to meet a Christian. In fact, they may not meet a Christian in their entire life. They may live their entire life in their community, in their culture, and never ever bump into another, to, to a Christian person who would be able to share the gospel with them. 
they may never in their life hear the name of Jesus Christ. And so they would not even have an awareness that there is Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who died for their sins. Never even hear the name spoken, much less an explanation of how that would work. Two billion people on this earth, close to 30% of the world's population would be classified as that. Do you know that there are more unreached people today than there were in the time of Christ? If you think about it, it's obvious because the population has grown so much since the time of Christ and the unreached people group has has gotten even larger. It's almost unimaginable for us here in this culture in the USA to think that there are people, there's no Christian radio station. If there is internet, it's, it's highly filtered so that Christian material can't get through. Where, where the, the laws of the country and the social construct is such that it's absolutely unacceptable slash illegal if you would go there for you to actually try and teach somebody about Jesus Christ because it's illegal to try and change somebody's religion. So this is the unreached world where it's difficult and dark and almost hopeless. And that, is, that should, it needs to be part of our focus as we look at the work of the Great Commission. Let's see, I have a map that kind of will, uh, here, here we go. Uh, the colors of the projector aren't that great, uh, but you get the point. You see the, uh, the green, I think it's green. The green part is where the church is established. That doesn't mean it's all perfect, but like in Vero Beach, if somebody wants to go to church, they're not going to have a hard time finding a church to go to. The yellow part is formative. Like the, 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 there is Christian witness there. There are missionaries working. There are churches. They may be in a, a very small minority, but they're there and they're active. But then the red part, primarily across the middle, this is parts of the world that are classified as unreached, where they don't have access to the gospel. And this needs to be part of our focus as we do the work of the Great Commission. Let, let me, uh, t- like we did in that first step, and go back to look at, first of all, what did the early church, what did those early church leaders, those disciples and those who they influenced, what was their response to the Great Commission in terms of the unreached world? Because Christ said, go into all the world, beginning with Jerusalem, go to Judea, surrounding, the area surrounding Jerusalem, to Samaria, an outer area where culturally they, didn't, they did not want to be, and to the uttermost parts of the ends of the earth. Go to all these places and teach the gospel. So what was their response? First of all, uh, I want to look at, uh, at a couple of examples quickly. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, you can mark this down or turn to it. We're not going to spend a lot of time here, but just refer to it. The apostle Paul had gone on a missions trip to Asia. So first of all, he had gone to Corinth, which was outside of the Hebrew nation. So this was part of the uttermost parts of the, this, the, the Corinth, the Corinthian people were an unreached people group back in that day. So Paul went to Corinth, taught the gospel, established a church there. And then he went from there to other places, one of which was to Asia, much farther away, teaching the gospel in Asia. So then he's writing a letter back to Corinth. Remember Corinth, that was one of the unreached people that he started a church at. He writes a letter from Asia back to them, and he says in this letter, I want you to know, brothers, about what happened when I was in Asia. He doesn't go into a lot of detail, but he talks about trouble that came upon him as he was out preaching the gospel in Asia, trouble that was so severe that he said, in his words, I despaired even of life. In other words, pretty sure I was going to die. Now, there are timid people who, if they get surprised by something, they're pretty sure they're going to die. Paul wasn't one of those people. Paul had been through all kinds of difficult times, been beaten within an inch of his life. He'd been in prison, he'd been persecuted. When Paul said, I was worried I was gonna die, something severe was carrying on. The point of the story is just this. He was writing back to the church of Corinth, which was one of those churches he started from an unreached people group, thanking them for praying for him. So that's just illustrating the part that, that he went to them, taught the gospel, started a church, They were so excited about learning about how they can have a relationship with the one true God that now they were helping to send Paul and pray for him as he went to Asia. He's writing back to give a report. Thanks for praying for me. Things were tough. I thought I was going to die. It was partly your prayers given for me that pulled me through. I'm just illustrating the role that they had in that. In the book of Philippians, we see several references to people from the book of Philippians, which is another place. It was outside. It was an unreached people group. Paul went there, taught the gospel, started a church. Now these people are sending money to help Paul go to other places. Again, they see what's happening, and it's much like us. 
Yeah, we're not the originals. We were back then an unreached people group. Now we have the gospel, and we're working to send the gospel to other places. And Paul is talking about how this group uh, from the church at Philippi not only sent money, but actually sent messengers to go and find him and encourage him and to bring him money. I know you're working hard. You probably have needs. Here's some money. We took up an offering. Here it is for you. Uh, I was talking to, to Steve Wade just this morning, who's the treasurer of our church, about sending the check from our Christmas Eve offering to the missionaries to encourage them. They didn't have the mail back then. They would send somebody to physically carry it, find Paul, give it to him with their message. We love you. We want to encourage you. We're with you. Go and keep doing this work. That's an example of how we should be doing some of this today. Amen. I want to tell you about two guys quickly. One is a guy named Okongo Samson. I met Okongo last September. I'd heard about him before that. Okongo is, there he is. He's from Kenya in East Africa. And uh, when he was a youngster, I think maybe late teens, early adulthood, uh, in Kenya, he had seen how uh, groups of Muslim uh, soldiers from the country to the north would come on raiding parties down and capture children in Kenya, kidnap them and take them back and force them to be child soldiers. So Okongo, this guy, his thought, was if I could go to those soldiers who are doing this, teach them the gospel, and if they come to faith in Christ, they'll stop kidnapping our children. It's not how I would think, but that's how he thought. So here's what Okongo did. He, he got a group of six other guys, seven total people, went up there, found one of these groups of people who were kidnapping their children, didn't rebuke them, he just started teaching them the gospel did not go well. They were all taken captive, imprisoned, and then one day all seven of them were brought out, put in a line, told to kneel. One by one were told to recant their faith. The first guy at the other end of the line refused to recant. They cut off his head. Second guy, the same thing. Third guy, fourth guy, fifth guy, sixth guy. So here's Okongo, the seventh guy in line. <clears throat> Six guys that he brought with him on this trip were there beheaded. They turned to him and they demand that he recant. I don't know exactly the words that he said, but it was something like this. Instead of even responding to them, he just said, Jesus, I'm coming to you now with this peaceful look of joy on his face. Which ticked them off. And they didn't cut off his head. There's this picture right there to prove they took him back into his cell, drove a steel bar through the muscle behind his calves, between his calf and his shins, hung him upside down in his cell until he would recant, which he never did. I don't know exactly the details, but eventually they let him go. Here's what Okongo does now. Okongo has organized groups of people to constantly be going back into these North African countries and going himself to continue doing this and over and over again he's been arrested and beaten and his life has been threatened. Here's something that I heard somebody say about Okongo. Wherever he goes, churches pop up. Churches are planted. He is doing the work of the Great Commission in the unreached world. This guy is a hero and I would love for you to meet him someday. Here's another guy I want to tell you about. His name is Isaac Shaw. The story is very different, yet there are some similarities. He's from, Delhi, from New Delhi, India. He became a missionary going into northern India. If you're familiar with India, you may know that the southern part of India, you think of all the, the technology that they have there and the things that they, the, the world has developed in India and the economy is, is great. They make movies and all of this, but that's just in a few areas of India. The vast reaches of northern India, this huge portion of territory, is one of the most difficult places on earth where the gospel is absolutely unwelcome. Isaac Shaw started going up to preach into there. And besides uh, the religious convictions, they have this caste system in India. And many of the people up there, they don't believe should even be allowed to have a book or to read or to go to church or to even hear something like the gospel or any other religion. And so that's what he's fighting against. He goes up there, I believe it was 29 different occasions his life was threatened or attempts were made on his life by people who wanted to stop him from going up there and doing the work of the gospel. 
but he kept going. And then he decided this is more than I can do myself. And he started a seminary in Delhi where he trains Indian pastors uh, with proper, strong theology, good, serious Bible training, who then are sent by mission, as missionaries up into northern India. And there are dozens and dozens of these pastors now in northern India working under the guidance and leadership of Isaac Shaw and the Delhi Bible Institute as missionaries into this area into northern India. Okay, here's the point. Vero Bible Fellowship's role in reaching the unreached world could be several things. Maybe there's somebody here in our congregation who God will inspire, train, and move to go and be a missionary like that somewhere. We had some people in our church, uh, in our previous church, Chris and Rebecca Vote, who are serving in a North African country that's much like what I've just described because God called them and prepared them and sent them, and we took up an offering for them on Christmas Eve. Our hope is there will be others from our church who will be prepared and go as missionaries into difficult places of the world taking this message. But aside from that, here's what we need to do. This is another one of those spots where you got to forget the droning of my voice as I've been talking now for quite a while and pay attention to this. This is the expectation that we, Vero Bible Fellowship, need to find people, missionaries, like Isaac Shaw, like Okongo Sampson, like Chris and Rebecca Vote, who are out there doing this and find ways to encourage them and support them and enable them. And as we do, we should be looking for uh, strategies and plans that they have, not just to uh, be nice to them, but what I'm looking for is, is there a guy like Isaac Shaw in the Delhi Bible Institute who has a plan that he would say to us at Vero Bible Fellowship Church, if you can help fund this, then I can put X number of missionaries out there in North Africa who are teaching the gospel to more people. And if you don't, if we don't do that, then they can't do it. We need to find those kind of people that we can get behind and support and pray for and encourage and send them into the unreached world to do this work of the Great Commission. And that's one way that we, the body of Vero Bible Fellowship, can be doing the work of the Great Commission globally. Another thing that's important to us, and this actually connected with that, is, I don't know if you know, but uh, we're, I'm, I'm very pleased with this, that from the very beginning of this church, 10% of all of the giving, 10% of every dollar that's given is set aside for missions. This is a church that doesn't just talk about missions, but we're actually directing 10% of all of the giving towards missions to support people like what we're talking about this morning to, so that we can be active in advancing the work of the gospel in the unreached world. And our focus is on helping missionaries in those difficult parts of the world. In addition to that 10%, occasionally we take up special offerings like we did on Christmas Eve where 100% of that offering goes. So we're doing that and we have a missions committee. Several of them are here who it's their responsibility to search for, vet, approve, and stay in communication with these missionaries who we can fund so that we as a church can have a relationship with these approved missionaries who are doing the work of the gospel. And that's an important work. That's, that's part of worshiping God through the work of the Great Commission yes. as we at Vero Bible Fellowship can do it. We also want to, by the way, if there are any of you this morning who would like to serve on that missions committee, we would love to talk to you. Uh, my wife, Jessica, back here. Jessica, you stand for a minute just so everybody knows you. You can find her or go through Pastor Greg and, uh, and say you're interested in joining the missions committee. We really do need some more people to be a part of that very, very important team that makes these, these decisions. We also desire in the future to occasionally organize some mission trips that would be things that you could go on and participate doing missions work actually practically yourself in, uh, in other parts of the world for short, short periods of time. There's another thing that's very interesting. Jessica pointed this out to me earlier. Not far from here, there's, uh, I think at Merritt Island, there's a group called Teen Missions International that, uh, that recruits young teens, like all the way from junior high school through high school, trains them, and Jessica did this herself when she was 15, 16 years old, went to the Amazon jungle in Brazil on a missions team and did missions work, which is part of why she's so passionate about missions today. And wouldn't it be cool if some of our teens from this church were interested in spending part of their summer going to some place like that doing missions work? Those are all things that we can do as we're carrying out the work of the Great Commission. Amen. Okay, in summary, there are two things, two major parts of how you and I 
who are meeting here in this cafeteria, this Vero Bible Fellowship, can be active in worshiping God through conducting the work of the Great Commission. Remember, this is something that we do. It's a commission, a commandment that requires obedient action. One is to be personally engaged in the ministry of the gospel, however God has enabled you. And it may be to be like Howard Moser or Terry Lilly, who I showed you on the screen a moment ago. Or it may be to be part of the team that sets up chairs and works behind the scenes or something in between. But God expects all of us to find that role and to do something as an active participating part in the work of the Great Commission. And I'm challenging you this morning to think about what is it that you are doing to obediently worship God through the work of the Great Commission here locally in our town. Secondly, we as a body must, as an act of obedience to Christ, be intentional about praying for, encouraging, and financially supporting the efforts of missionaries who are being effective in reaching the unreached world. It's imperative that we as a church are identified by our ability and our determination to do exactly that. And so that's our challenge this morning. And as vital as it is to worship God by being active in the work of the Great Commission, also important to note that the first step towards that is to personally come to terms with the message of the gospel itself. And as we talk about the work of the Great Commission this morning, it's possible, it's likely, that there are people here who either it doesn't totally make sense to, or maybe it makes sense but they're not really caught into it because you have never personally come to express faith in Christ, never accepted the message of the gospel. And I want this morning to give you an opportunity, if that's you, to do exactly that. But first I want to just quickly and carefully go through what, do, what are we talking about when we talk about the gospel. The, the essence of the gospel starts with God. God is our creator, the one true God, not one of many gods, but the one God who created heaven and earth, who is working to hold it all together. He created you and me, created us personally in his image, because he had a special connection or love for us as human beings, as opposed to all other elements of his creation, which are also wonderful, but God had a special love for us, so he created man in his image. God is different than us in that he's holy. He's perfect. That's what the word holy means. He's, he's perfect. He's without flaw, without mistake, without intentional sin or wrongdoing. He lives in heaven, a place that's filled with joy, that he's created to reflect his own glory. Heaven is a place that's perfect. There's no sin there. There's no wrong there. There's no sadness there. It's much different than here on earth. And that's God's home that he's prepared for us to come and join him. But there's one thing that God could never allow into heaven, because frankly, it would spoil heaven, and that is sin. The Bible tells us that sin is anything that we would say or think or do that goes against God's laws. And it also tells us that we're all sinners. The Bible says that we've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So no matter how good you might feel about yourself or how nice someone else says you are, all of us, without exception, are born with this condition of being sinners. When I was a kid, my dad taught me a lot of things. But one thing he never taught me is how to disobey, how to do wrong things. I did that quite naturally. He spent a lot of his time and physical effort to teach me not to disobey. That's because I was born with this tendency, this desire, this nature to sin. And so that by default made me ineligible to be in heaven. The Bible says again that sin is those things that we do that displease God, but it also says that sin has to be punished. Because of God's holiness and perfection, he can't allow sin to go unpunished. The Bible tells us that the wages of sin is death. But it's not just physical death that happens to all of us actually because of sin. But much worse than that, the wages of sin is death being separation from God forever in a place of eternal punishment where we will never again, after leaving this earth, unless we're right with God and by forgiveness can go to heaven, we would never again be able to experience God's presence or experience his love or his joy. We'd be absolutely terminally separated from God forever as the punishment for sin. 
But God didn't want that for us. Some people say, well, how, are asked the question, how could a God who's a God of love allow that to happen so that people would go to hell and be punished forever? And God's answer to that is he doesn't want that. And so he's provided a way so that you and I can be saved from that punishment for our sin. And that way is through his son, Jesus Christ, who was born, grew up, lived a perfect life, a sinless life, the only one who ever lived who was sinless, went around, as we talked about this morning, with his disciples teaching, doing miracles. And then eventually, according to the plan of God, was arrested, was crucified. And in that crucifixion, God's wrath and punishment for sin was poured out on his own son on our behalf, died his physical death was buried and after three days rose again from the dead and now ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God. And this happened so that God's demand that sin be punished could be taken care of. And now here, if you and I, or if you today, have never accepted Christ as your savior from sin, here's what you can do. And here's what I have done. First of all, I've admitted, and you can admit that you're a sinner. Some people refuse to admit that that they have this condition of sin that separates them from God. To admit that, yes, I, I am a sinner. I've done plenty of wrong things. And secondly, to express belief that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, died on the cross for your sins. That he died to take your punishment. So if you say, God, I admit that I'm a sinner. I believe that Christ died on the cross for my sin. Then just call out to God and say, God, will you save me? I repent, I want to turn from my sin. I want you to change me. Will you save me from sin and make me your child? And in that way, you today can become a child of God. And this is the simple message of salvation. This is what Peter and John were talking about when they stood in front of that healed beggar who was jumping and dancing and rejoicing in the temple because his knees and his legs, his ankles and his feet were strengthened. He could jump and rejoice and worship God. It wasn't enough. This is why they said, repent, that your sins might be blotted out, so that times of refreshing can come. And that, my friends, is the gospel. That is the message of salvation. This is what Christ was saying when he said, go into all the world and teach the gospel. Making disciples, teaching them to obey the things I've commanded you. And it's going to be tough. People are going to be killed. There's going to be difficulty. There will be times when you despair even of life like Paul did. There will be times when like Okongo's six other companions, lives are lost for the sake of the gospel. But I will be with you, empowering you, always, even to the end of the earth. So guys, we have this command this morning before us. If we want to be true worshipers, carrying out what we were created to do, created to worship, then what God is saying to us, be active in sharing the gospel and however you can. Personally, as part of a body, an operation that's out there doing this Bureau Bible Fellowship, be concerned, praying for, working towards taking the gospel to the unreached parts of the world to people who otherwise will not hear. Let's be committed to that. And if this morning you're saying, I've never really come to terms with the gospel personally, I know I am a sinner. I do believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross and I desire to call to God for salvation, I'd like to invite you as we stand and as Brenton sings this song to just come up here. We have some people here who would love nothing more this morning than to just talk to you and pray with you and show you from God's word how you can become a child of God in good stead before. And let's stand together.